Welcome to the Zoom today, Mary Livingston. Uh, we're doing interviews with the first nine, first nine of the 10 female pilots in the US Air Force. What inspired you to join the Air Force? Well, um, what inspired me was really my brother. My brother uh, is six years older. I'm the youngest of a lot of kids, but um, a brother is six years older and he was in the Air Force and loved it. And so I went ahead when, you know, I was in, in college and getting ready to graduate. Uh, I saw some Air Force recruiting ads on the television and they had planes flying off into the sunset. And I went, wow, I would love to do that. And so I went down to the local recruiter at Purdue University and he pretty much told me that women couldn't fly. Uh, it wasn't an op opportunity, but he gave me other options that were exciting. And so knowing how my brother loved the Air Force, I went ahead and took the Air Force officer qualification test, did well, passed the physical with flying colors and was said, hey, you've got a slot. And I took it. And so my inspiration would have to be, I guess, at the beginning would be my brother. And then the uh, advertisement and the excellence of the Air Force recruiter. That's awesome. What did your family think about your choice to pursue the aviation career field? Well, yeah, actually they were more worried about me joining the Air Force. They, they uh, thought that that was maybe an unwise decision but after I'd been in the Air Force for a couple of years and you know, uh, applying to be a pilot, I'm not sure when I actually told them I was doing that, but for them, it was just me continuing my Air Force career. And it really probably wasn't a shock. My dad owned a small plane uh, with uh, some other men and I had already uh, been working on a private pilot's license. So um, I don't think that it was really a big deal to them at all because I didn't really make it a big deal. It was just, hey, this is something I'm trying for, but I don't think I went into the details. How did you learn about the opportunity to, to start flying in the Air Force? <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> I was stationed at Peterson uh, Field at that time. Uh, and Air Force Base that had just closed and we moved out to Pete Field. And all the women that were of the eligible age were actually called into a conference room to be informed that this was something that was going to start. And that, that was my first inkling and I was excited. So yeah, that they're, you know, the uh, ability to communicate is not quite as easy then as it is today. And so really much of the communication was, you know, in conferences, you know, and in discussions. What did it mean to you to be part of the first undergraduate pilot training class to include women? Well, uh, for me, you know, I already told you that my goal was to fly. I, you know, and so to me, it was just an opportunity to fly. I, I loved flying. I thoroughly enjoyed my career in the Air Force uh, before flying. But later, I would say that having that opportunity to be in that first class, um, it was a chance to inspire other women. For example, there was a woman who wanted to be a pilot in the Air Force, and this is when I was stationed at Randolph Force, Air Force Base. And so she found me, I'm not quite sure how, and so she wanted to know how she could better enhance her chances to become a pilot. And so we met a few times, and uh, that was just exciting, meeting with her and being able to encourage her. And she actually uh, did become a pilot. Her name is Andrea Kowalski. Andrea, if you're out there, hello. I thoroughly enjoyed meeting you. And uh, then later, I would say that when I was, um, you know, at my first duty assignment, other duty assignments, I tended to avoid all publicity. 
and we'll get into that later, but I would always go to, you know, Girl Scouts, um, other youth um, presentations. Um, I taught, you know, Sunday school. I, I taught um, um, Bible studies. And, you know, it's one of those things, and it's always been, I've been working with youth. And so it was an, a way to let youth know, which included women and young girls, that there, that, you know, hopefully I could be an inspiration. So that really, it, for me, it was selfish. I just wanted to fly. But later on, I was thankful for the opportunity to maybe encourage and inspire others. That's great. How do you feel about having your story featured in the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force? I'm honored. <laughs> I don't deserve it. I am honored. You definitely deserve it. <laughs> Jennifer, you could have done it here just as well. I just happened to be at the right place at the right time and had the opportunity. Right, but you took that opportunity and that's important. Yes, well. <laughs> when, museum, when museum visitors see your exhibit, what do you hope they will learn from your experience? Uh, I would hope that they would learn that the Air Force has opportunities for everyone in many different fields. Uh, granted, the focus is on, you know, us being trailblazers, but each person is a trailblazer in their own way because each person is a unique individual. And so I want them to see that they, as a unique individual, they have opportunities as well. And just as you said, to take advantage of them. Take advantage of what the Air Force can offer. <laughs> We've already touched on this, but uh, before a pilot training open to women, had you thought about becoming a pilot? Well, I hadn't thought about becoming a pilot uh, other than the fact just recreational flying. And the fact that um, my dad had a plane uh, was, was certainly a big factor because I love flying with him. Now I have, you know, four older brothers and dad wanted them all to fly and none of them really ever pursued it. And what he didn't realize his youngest a daughter was going, man, I can hardly wait until I'm old enough. And then he sold his share of the plane. <laughs> so, you know, it was just something that I thoroughly enjoyed doing and wanted to do. And so um, I started working on a private pods license uh, when I was in high school and through college. Uh, unfortunately, I was also a poor high school student and a poor college student. So I really wasn't able to finish my uh, certificate until I was uh, at Peterson Field. You were an inspiration to many women who joined the Air Force and became pilots. What women inspired you to break barriers and be the first, be part of the first class of undergraduate pilot training to include women? Uh, the first person I would have to say would be my grandmother. Um, I've lived with her for the first four or five years of my life. And she was an incredibly strong woman. And then afterwards, um, <clears throat> The, the person I called mom, she owned a small business with my dad and she was certainly a, a partner there. I have older sisters and though they would certainly not say they were um, breakers of barriers, they were also just uh, excellent in what they did. So I never saw where women were held back so much um, because of their um, abilities, uh, I saw that it was more maybe that uh, society would be uh, more restrictive. Uh, for example, when I mentioned to a counselor in high school that I, you know, wanted to do something that was non-traditional, basically, and I'm sure the other women would say the same thing, we were pretty much told, well, you know, you could be a teacher or a nurse, 
And uh, I went, well, you don't know me. You know, I mean, I was so naive that I really had no concept of the uh, barriers that were out there because the women in my life seemed to be very capable and um, doing well in what they had chosen. Sadly, Susan Rogers passed away in 1992. How would you describe her? You know, really didn't know her. She was in the other flight and we really didn't have much interaction uh, between the two flights. Uh, what interaction I did have with her, she'd probably say the same thing about me and that she was really very unassuming, uh, very quiet. And so um, like some of us, I think was very willing to allow others to be in the forefront of the publicity. And we were content to be in the background, just focusing on, on pilot training. So that would be my perception of her. How long did you serve in the Air Force and what rank were you when you retired? I served 20 years and I was a Lieutenant Colonel. What were some of your most memorable assignments or missions? Are there any significant events from your career you would like to share? Well, I would say one of my most memorable assignments was actually uh, my first one, and that was a manpower management officer at uh, an Air Force Base and then Pete Field, um, because that really set the tone for my entire Air Force career. I had an outstanding commander. Um, he was a, we were a small detachment and it's a small career field. And uh, he, you know, had been a pilot in Vietnam. My direct supervisor had been a pilot in Vietnam. And, you know, when I was looking at being, you know, uh, applying for being uh, in, the, in pilot training, they were both incredibly supportive and encouraging and, you know, following up to make sure that, you know, I had everything done that needed to be done to ensure success. So I would say <laughs> that would be a memorable assignment right there because without your commander and supervisor's encouragement, um, the, the process would have been much more difficult. Um, after that, <laughs> you know, um, what would be uh, a memorable uh, assignments? Uh, I would have to say probably at the Air Force Academy flying the TG-7A because that was a very unique aircraft. I think there were only five to seven of them in the Air Force. It was a uh, aircraft designed to uh, uh, train uh, cadets on how to fly sailplanes. So um, that was a unique role and I thoroughly enjoyed that. And uh, as far as a memorable mission, you know, if you're ever an instructor pilot, um, I could bore you for hours with memorable missions with students. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think it took so long for the Air Force to start training female pilots since the WASP had proven women's ability during World War II? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, it was opened up in 1976 at uh, really the end of the Vietnam uh, conflict. And so there were a lot of pilots that were, <laughs> that were in desk, flying desks at that time. So there really wasn't a need for pilots. And so I would say that it that really, the demand was low and the supply was high. In fact, I was always very surprised that they did start the test program in 76, given the dynamics of what the pilot uh, structure was like at that time. Did you think pilot training was more difficult because of your gender? Um, you know, that's hard to say because that would depend on the instructor. 
my instructor, T37 instructor, was excellent. His name was Chuck Lucas, and he had one other student, and I really never perceived a difference between the two. The, uh, the probably the biggest uh, issue that would cause difficulty going through pilot training was all the publicity. And that would be um, because that caused resentment by some of the men. It certainly caused resentment among some of the other students, you know, male students that we were in a flight with, uh, because they were um, doing the same thing we were, yet they weren't getting recognition for the effort they were putting into it. And so trying to overcome um, that resentment, and rightfully so, made it a little bit more difficult to have that sense of teamwork and working together to be a success. I think that in our flight um, of five women, we were able to um, develop a sense of teamwork with the other men, but it did require work. And so, yes, that, that part was more difficult, but again, I would go back to, um, particularly since I was an instructor, a lot would just depend on your instructor. Did you ever feel standards or requirements were modified to help women pass pilot training? You know, uh, I've thought long on this question because um, I, you know, there were always rumors. Um, and so I would have to say I'm unsure. But looking back as an instructor, I know that there could have, there was probably pressure on the instructors for us to succeed. But I also know as an instructor, you um, feel very much a sense of responsibility for your, your students to do well, because if not, you could be putting them into um, a hazardous situation that they cannot handle and they can injure themselves, kill themselves and hurt other people. So for me, um, would never, never with any of my students lowered standards for whatever reason, because I cared more about them as an individual than them being a pilot. Why were the female students required to attend pilot screening prior to starting their class with the male peers? I know that some women were a little resentful of that. I was thrilled. That was free. You know, I don't know about 40, 50 hours of free flying time. I was used to having to pay about $50 an hour for flying. And all of a sudden the Air Force is going, whoa, hey, I'm going to let you go to this T-41 and you're going to get more small plane experience. So I was thrilled. Um, and I understood it was a test program. And I understood that even though I had a private pilot's license, um, they needed to get probably physiological, psychological data on us. I had no problem with that. There were other men who were part of the flight screening process. You know, uh, virtually everybody that goes into pilot training at that time had to go through flight screening. You know, the Air Force Academy cadets went through, you know, the T-41s at the Academy. Uh, people that joined in through other commissioning sources, if they didn't have a product license, they had to go to Hondo. So I really didn't see that as being um, an issue. I thought it was a benefit. I got to see how the Air Force, you know, how their approach to flying differed from what I had been taught as a civilian. And I was very thankful that in getting my private's license at Peterson uh, Air Force Base that I had a military pilot that was my instructor because he followed the same, what you might call stringent standards that the Air Force did. And that actually helped prepare me for flight screening. Awesome. Do you think the acceptance of female aviators during the 1970s was symbolic of changes in America? Um, you know, even though I mentioned earlier there was a surplus of um, pilots at that time, uh, society was changing. 
and it got to be, and you have to understand I have an economics background and I taught economics at the Air Force Academy that, you know, uh, when you're looking at a pool of applicants, the larger your pool of applicants, um, the better quality you have in selection. And so I saw that as just a natural outgrowth of just society realizing that they were restricting half of their pool of qualified people to fill positions. And so to me, it was just a natural outgrowth of that. And that is true whether you look at genders, whether you look at uh, race, you know, uh, what other therapist stereotypes there are. You know, if you start restricting your pool, then you start restricting your, your qualified applicants. What aircraft did you fly during your career? Well, um, T-37, well, T-41, T-37, T-38, uh, TG-7A, and the SG-233, which was a sailplane at the academy. If women had not been limited to flight instructors and transport and tanker pilots, which aircraft would you have chosen? Well, you know, hindsight's always 2020. I actually, when I was graduate, you know, when I put in my dream sheet for what aircraft I wanted to fly, I put down tanker. And the reason is that many of the women really had specific desires of what type of aircraft they wanted to fly. And I knew that some women really wanted to be instructors. And I was like, hey, I'm happy. I'm going to fly whatever. And I know that there's not going to be a line out the door for people that want to fly a tanker. And uh, being from the north, I thought, wow. So I asked for a tanker to Loring, Maine, uh, KI Sawyer, Michigan, you know, all those northern tier bases. And I figured there's no line for there either. So I thought, hey, you know, I'll be able to be back where there's snow and all sorts of fun things. And, um, but I got an inkling about two weeks before graduation, the uh, uh, DO came and said, Mary, would you be upset if you were an instructor? And I went, no, but I asked for a tanker. He goes, well, I know that. And so, and then he walked off and I went, uh-oh, I think I'm gonna be an instructor. <laughs> and, you know, I uh, loved being an instructor. Absolutely loved it. So looking in hindsight, I would have asked to be an instructor. But at the time, given the dynamics of, uh, of what you're thinking as you go through pilot training, everybody is striving for that fighter. Everybody is striving for excellence. And so I probably would have asked for a fighter like probably many of the other women, and certainly like many of the men, but I am thrilled that the Air Force placed me in the instructor role. Did you ever regret not being able to fly a combat aircraft? No, because I love so much being, um, being an instructor. I, I never saw that as being a restriction because uh, at that time they had made being actually in it was air training command at that time, um, being an instructor was a career path. Now, if it hadn't been so that it could be a career path for me, I may have been um, more concerned about not being able to be in a fighter aircraft. I, I really don't know because I never had to make that decision. How long were you at the academy? I was actually stationed there a couple of times, one as an economics instructor, and then um, you were always uh, also assigned, if you were a pilot, down to the airfield. And that was when I flew the TG-7A. Uh, I was also back there again as um, the chief of standards and evaluation, and that's when I flew a T-41. My husband, has his PhD in electrical engineering. And so he had uh, a couple of assignments there. And so that's the reason that I was assigned to the Air Force Academy. Was your status as one of the first Air Force female pilots well-known throughout your career? 
do you think it impacted your career or experiences with the Air Force? <laughs> oh yeah, when, you, when, you, when you're walking on a base for the first time, I'm thinking about when I walked on Columbus Air Force Base and you're wearing wings, um, you know, I was in my, what was, you know, your service dress uniform and you're wearing wings, uh, I'll just share a story with you. I'm, I'm walking, you, you had to join the officer's club. So I'm walking into the officer's club uh, to join. And I'm in my, you know, uniform, blues. I'm not wearing a flight suit. And uh, I was, you know, we were doing your normal salutes. And, and I see these two guys really staring at me. And I'm, I'm chuckling to myself because I'm thinking they're trying to figure out are those flight nurse wings or are those pilot wings? So anyway, you know, they're really staring and you know, it's really hard to tell from a distance. So we pass. Anyway, I count to 10 and I turn around and I wave because both of them are turned around and they're staring at me. <laughs> You know, so um, yes, uh, did it, you know, uh, people, you know, the people uh, knew just because of your wings and you were the only person female there that had wings that yes, it, um, it, it, it certainly made you uh, stand out. <laughs> I don't know if that's necessarily good or bad, but um, the other issue with that is that, um, you know, and I, I, it's never in any of your questions, is that it really impacted my relationship with other women. For example, when I first was assigned at Columbus Air Force Base, um, the wives were extraordinarily concerned about this woman that was gonna be flying with their husbands. Actually, I was flying with students, not their husbands, but you know, that's not where they were coming from. And so I was actually involved invited to um, uh, a flight instructor's house for dinner with he and his family. And I get there, I go say, hey, you know, what, what, what can I bring? Oh, don't bring anything. Well, you know, and this is Mississippi. Uh, any special dress you want me to wear? Oh, no, just, you know, wear usual. So I arrive there with, you know, you know, nice slacks, top kind of thing. And I walk into the house and she has the table set up with their fine china, fine glassware. The kids were sent off to the babysitters. She's dressed to the nines. And I'm thinking, uh-oh, I'm at a job interview. <laughs> and anyway, and after dinner and discussions and that kind of thing, she confessed her worry about me. And she goes, I was really expecting you to be tall, beautiful, drive up in this fancy car. And though you can't see it, I'm only 5'4". Beautiful has never been a description. Cute maybe, but not beautiful. And so it working with women to ensure that they knew that we were not um, trying to compete with them, that, that, was, uh, that, that was probably a valuable experience. And the other thing goes with the men. You know, you know you're accepted when you're part of a gripe session with men. And the men say, hey, I heard that all you women got the assignments that you wanted. And I actually looked at these men and I said, yeah. I asked for a T-37 to Columbus Air Force Base, Mississippi. And they all looked and they went, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> so yes, it certainly impacted my experience, but, you know, uh, approaching it with, you know, it wasn't about me. It's also about them. We're all a team working together for the success of the mission. You know, that went a long way. I uh, purposely earlier mentioned I avoided publicity because I was doing the same thing the other men were doing. 
any women that would follow me um, at Columbus Air Force Base would have to either, uh, would have to possibly live down the reputation that I established. And I wanted for anybody that followed me, any woman to follow me, the guys would say, oh, hey, it's just another woman, they're fine. That was really um, my, my whole purpose. And, uh, but yeah, it, it, it was a lot of fun. And I have more stories like that as well, where um, people were very concerned and uh, yes, and that, exper that, that does change the experiences I would have for most men because um, most, most units you go to, they're not concerned about, oh, there's a man joining this unit. You know, so yeah, it, it certainly made a difference, but hard work and sense of humor tended to overcome all those obstacles. I still love the expression on the guy's face when I turned around and waved to them after they had been staring at me. <laughs> Did becoming one of the first Air Force female pilots open other opportunities in your career? Probably. I would think um, me becoming the uh, assistant professor at the uh, Air Force Academy, uh, they certainly, me being a pilot and they want pilots on the teaching staff, I'm certain that that helped me get that position. Um, as um, I went in to be a squadron commander for recruiting, again, they want, you know, a varied career fields and me being a pilot, I'm certain helped. The advantage of possibly filling another niche as being a woman I think would certainly be an advantage. So yes, was there an advantage? Probably, but not one that I ever actively promoted. The thing that I miss hearing at Air Force bases is the dog whistle of the T-37 flying overhead. <laughs> I have about, I think it's about 3,500 hours. I can't remember exactly in the T-37. So that will always have a small, very soft spot in my heart. <laughs> awesome. How do you think your success impacted other women? No idea. You'd have to ask the other women that had to, that followed me to be perfectly honest. Um, I, I, my goal was to be um, successful. Um, and my goal was to be known as a pilot, not necessarily a woman pilot. And um, so, you know, you seriously, you, you'd have to ask You'd have to ask other women. Since you were involved in breaking the barriers for female Air Force pilots, did you break any other barriers during your career? Uh, I, I would have to go back. I, you know, honestly don't know what barriers I may have broken, but I would say that um, I tried to break negative perceptions one person at a time. And though those aren't barriers that people, you know, see emblazoned on the side of buildings that wow, or, you know, you certainly don't get put into a museum exhibit because you were able to change someone's perception. Uh, to me, that was really my purpose was to break down barriers, men and women, one person at a time. That's great. Did you have any other firsts in your, in your career? Were you the first woman of anything else? Well, you know, all of us were. I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting looking at what other people wrote as first. Well, I was the first this. Well, when you know, when you're the first class of women graduating from pilot training, wherever you go, whatever you do, you are going to be first. Um, you know, so I, I really can't say that there was anything particular that I would say that was necessarily a trailblazing. Uh, again, it's just where um, God placed me um, for me to, again, be a, an example for the others. You know, that, that, that certainly doesn't answer your question. Um, and probably not the answer most people want, but that's where I really considered myself to be a trailblazer was just working with one person at a time, breaking barriers. 
What message would you give to young women considering a career in the Air Force? For any career, you know, it's uh, not about you. It's about the mission of the organization. And really each of us have talents that we need to uh, use to help any mission be a success. And, you know, and if, you're, if your desire is to be a female pilot, I was just very blessed to have that opportunity to be a pilot and I think be successful. Um, but for you, I mean, look at you. Here you are, you're a success where you are. And I would think that you would probably have the same advice. And that is, you know, um, strive to make the mission a success. And if you can make the mission a success, then you are a success, success as well. well. Those are all of the questions, but do you have anything else you'd like to share? Any stories or advice or anything kind of comes to mind? Well, you know, it, the one thing that I would say that's nice being in the first group is that of course now there's all this emphasis on us. And what is probably surprising to many people that are looking from the outside, the 10 of us weren't particularly close. We were very focused, pilot training is a very demanding environment and we were very focused on just doing well. So you could ask me, you know, not only about Susan Rogers, but Kathy Lasas, Vicki Crawford, um, you know, really any of the other women, and except for my roommate, Carol Scherer, whom you're going to interview next, I really didn't know them very well. And we are actually getting to know each other better now than what we did back then. And so I thank the Air Force for giving us that opportunity to reconnect. And thank you, Jennifer, for giving us an opportunity to reconnect. And, and hopefully in what you are doing and what the Air Force Museum is doing, we'll hopefully encourage anyone to look at the Air Force as an opportunity where they can succeed. 